Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. Those words were written by Lord Acton in 1887 as part of a letter written to a friend. The idea behind those words has been around much longer, though. Acton's words were generally seen as an evaluation of the period of absolutism, which engulfed Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. As we explore this era in greater depth, we begin with the man who personifies European absolutism, Louis XIV of France. Politics in Europe had changed in some ways substantially from the Renaissance period. The fight for political centralization had led to the development of successful kingdoms which, thanks to the European Age of Exploration, had often become empires. As these states had centralized, monarchs often relied on cultural homogeneity, including enforced religious unity or a practice of tolerance, to legitimize their power. Spain had their Inquisition. France had fought their wars of religion, culminating in the Edict of Nantes. England had the Elizabethan Settlement. Even the Confederacy of the Holy Roman Empire had the Peace of Augsburg and, eventually, the Peace of Westphalia. These centralizing monarchs of the 15th and 16th centuries often claimed a divine right to rule. Divine right is not a new concept in human political history, but claiming a divine right to rule is not quite the same thing as claiming an absolute power to rule, a political power unlimited by laws or rules or traditions. Claiming absolute power was often seen as the next and final step of political centralization. But in a world where adhering to the wrong religious belief could lead some subjects to revolt, it was necessary to try and enforce the concept of absolutism divorced from religion, divorced from the divine right to rule. A French Catholic political scholar, Jean Baudin, sought systematic secular answers to the problems of political disorder. He wrote The Six Books of the Republic in 1576. The book compared different forms of government throughout history and concluded that there were basically three types of sovereignty, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. But of the three, Vaudan concluded that only strong monarchy offered hope for maintaining order long term. It was Vaudan who helped lay a secular rationale for absolutism the idea that a monarch should be the sole and uncontested source of power within a state. Of course, European monarchs had already, for the most part, been consolidating power within their own hands, often by attempting to limit the influence of the nobility. They'd done this by expanding the ranks of noble families, as France did, or by hiring trained individuals, often but not always non-nobles, to occupy positions within the government. These officials, these bureaucrats, advised the monarch and executed the monarch's orders, but they could not hope to become the monarch, and that was important. Their advice centered around what was good for the state and, by extension, what was good for the monarch. And so it was that King Louis XIII's closest advisor, Cardinal Richelieu, a Catholic clergyman, advised Louis to support the Protestants, not the Catholics, during the Thirty Years' War, even as Richelieu counseled Louis to crush Huguenot resistance in France itself. As Richelieu noted, he was looking out for the benefits of France, not the Church, in his role as First Minister. It was, in particular, Louis XIII's son, the French King Louis XIV, who would personify the absolutist ruler. In 1651, Louis XIV declared that l'État c'est moi, I am the state, and he worked to manipulate the affections and ambitions of his courtiers and nobles to ensure his monopoly on power. Louis would, of course, depend on his extended bureaucracy, but that bureaucracy, because of the issue of salaries and military might, tended to be quite loyal to their king. Louis had been only five years old at the time of his father's death and of his accession to the throne. His father's chief advisor, Cardinal Richelieu, had involved France in the Thirty Years' War. Higher taxes and consequently greater tax revolts had ensued. Louis's mother, Anne of Austria, and her advisor and rumored lover, Cardinal Mazarin, ruled as regents in young Louis's name. So as to defray the costs of the Thirty Years' War, Mazarin sold new offices, he continued to raise taxes, and he forced creditors to extend loans to the government. 
The nobles of France saw an opportunity to take back power because of how unpopular Mazarin was. In 1648, a coalition of Mazarin's opponents presented him with a charter of demands that would have limited the power of the monarchy. Mazarin responded aggressively and thus faced a series of revolts that involved almost every social group in France. These revolts, collectively known as the Fronde, lasted until 1653 and were focused around Paris in the north, Bordeaux in the west, and Marcel in the southeast. While the monarchy survived the Fronde, Louis XIV never forgot the uncertainty of his childhood. To prevent the possibility of his kidnapping, Louis was moved from palace to palace, constantly on guard against a nobility who sought to curtail his power or to co-opt it by controlling him. Even as a teenager, Louis swore that in his own government, his policies would be designed to prevent the repetition of any such revolts. When Mazarin died in 1661, the 23-year-old king decided to rule without a first advisor. His greatest concern remained the French nobility. Louis worked to replace their tendency toward rebellion and violence with court ritual. Using a system of bestowing pensions, offices, honors, gifts, and the threat of royal disfavor, or the promise of royal favor, he forced the nobility to cooperate with him making him the center of French power and culture. Access to the king became the most valuable commodity for a noble, and that access was highly limited. Participation at court required constant study in order not to fall into royal disfavor. Louis' preferred styles could change without notice, and the smallest lapse in etiquette could lead to disaster for anyone associated with the royal court. In her journal, the Duchess of Orléans and Louis' sister-in-law, Elizabeth Charlotte, complained that, quote, everything here is pure self-interest and deviousness. And yet, she gloried in the special position that her closeness to Louis granted her. The arts were used to emphasize Louis' position. His daily life was littered with a variety of public performances, mock battles, dramas, ballet, all of this meant to glorify his prestige. Louis took to calling himself the Sun King, and he decorated his court with statues of Apollo to further delineate that connection. It isn't an accident that this is the time when the Copernican system was becoming more accepted. Louis was placing himself at the center of the universe for the French people. Louis emulated the pomp and style of ancient Roman emperors. At the birth of his first son in 1662, he dressed in Roman attire. Louis' government officials, in turn, treated the arts as a branch of the government. Pensions were meted out to artists who worked for the government and sometimes protected writers from religious criticism. The most famous of these protected writers was the playwright Molière, whose comedy Tartuffe poked fun of religious hypocrites. Louis' officials set up academies for dance, painting, architecture, and music, and took control of the Académie Française, the French Academy, which, to this day, decides the correct usage of the French language. Even furniture reflected the king's taste. A furniture workshop created the delicate and ornate pieces which would be sold under the king's own name. Although publications were severely censored, music and theater nonetheless enjoyed special prominence. Operas were commissioned to celebrate royal marriages and baptisms, as well as military victories. Ballet also became important, and Louis himself danced in these ballets if the roles seemed especially important. Smart choreographers wrote roles for him. Massive public works further glorified the royal image. Military facilities like veterans' hospitals and newly fortified towns represented military power, while urban improvements, like the reconstruction of the Louvre Palace in Paris, showcased royal wealth and would, starting in the 1680s, serve as a place to display the art collection that Louis and his ancestors had collected over centuries. Eventually, the French Academy for Ballet, as well as the Academy for Painting and Sculpture, would be housed at the Louvre as well. But Louis' greatest architectural achievement would be his new palace and capital at Versailles, a town 12 miles from Paris. In 
Building began in the 1660s and by 1685 employed 36,000 workers, not including the troops who diverted a local river to supply water to Versailles for its many pools and fountains. Royal workshops were set up to produce tapestries, carpets, mirrors, and porcelains. The gardens were a study in order meant to emphasize Louis's control over his kingdom. The palace, however, could be cramped and cold despite its size, especially when 15,000 people were crowded into the palace apartments. Trash collected in the hallways and thieves and prostitutes set up shop as well. By the time Louis actually moved to Versailles in 1682, he had already been a monarch for nearly four years. When his wife died in 1683, he secretly married his mistress, François de Aubigny, and conducted most state affairs from her apartments. Her opponents complained that she controlled all of the royal appointments, but in actuality, she was focused on her own projects, which included the founding of a school for girls from impoverished noble families, and a dedication to reinforce Orthodox Catholicism, a dedication which Louis shared. In 1685, Louis issued the Edict of Fontainebleau, which revoked the 1598 Edict of Nantes. Louis saw himself as a paternal power who should instruct his subjects in the one true religion, just as he instructed them in true government. The Edict of Fontainebleau was another way to illustrate Louis's control over his subjects. It was another way to reinforce the idea of absolute power. Thousands of Huguenots immigrated to England, Prussia, or the Dutch Republic. Many of them also began writing against absolutism. Louis could not have ruled so successfully without his system of bureaucracy, a system of state officials carrying out orders according to a regular and routine line of authority. The word bureaucracy itself comes from the French word bureau, meaning desk or many drawers, which then came to mean office in both the sense of a physical space and a position of authority. Louis extended his bureaucracy further than any French king before him, these officials reduced local nobles' power over finances. Because of measures like these, Louis would not face many revolts despite the fact that he would double the taxes raised during his reign. Louis relied on dedicated ministers, usually of modest origins, who were loyal to him because through him they gained fame, wealth, and sometimes even nobility. One such example is Jean-Baptiste Colbert, Louis's Minister of Finance. Colbert had worked his way up the ranks, first as Mazarin's personal finance advisor, before becoming Louis's advisor. Colbert used his bureaucracy to establish official mercantilist economic policy. According to that doctrine, there is a finite amount of wealth in the world, so states need to do their best to take as big a slice of that pie as possible. Governments thus needed to intervene in economic affairs so as to increase national wealth by whatever means possible. In the 17th century, the adoption of mercantilism as an official economic policy meant that states were intensely interested in acquiring colonies. During Louis's reign, French explorers charted the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico, claiming land in that basin as Louisiana. French merchants established trading posts in South Asia and the Indian Ocean Basin. Louis established diplomatic missions in Morocco, Persia, and Siam. He also attempted to assert French influence over Portuguese influence in China. While he was unsuccessful in supplanting the Portuguese at that time, the outreach did bring Arcadio Wang to France. Wang, a Chinese Christian, initially came to Europe with the hope of training to be a priest, but instead, he became a translator for the French government, and he worked in the royal library. In addition to the possible riches to be had around the world, Louis also wanted to expand French influence in Europe. In 1667, as Louis approached his 30th birthday, he sparked the War of Devolution. Louis made a claim on Spanish lands, saying that they devolved to him via his wife, the Spanish princess Maria Teresa, as part of her dowry. Louis demanded that Spain hand over lands in the Netherlands and the Franche Comté, a territory along France's eastern border. 
When Spain refused to hand over these lands, Louis attacked and defeated the Spanish armies in the Spanish Netherlands, essentially modern-day Belgium. However, England, the Dutch Republic, and Sweden joined the war on Spain's side, so Louis was forced to compromise. The Treaty of Aix la Chapelle allowed Louis to claim only a few towns in the Spanish Netherlands. Perhaps more importantly, this action broke the Franco-Dutch alliance, which had begun during the Dutch Republic's fight for independence from Spain. Of course, Spain's inattention in domestic matters during this period was costly. In 1668, just as this war was ending, Portugal succeeded in winning, again, its independence from Spain. This break would be permanent. Portugal would never again fall under Spain's authority. Louis wasn't done. In 1672, he declared war on the Dutch Republic, seeing them as his first obstacle, and he thought the most easily defeated obstacle, to French expansion in Europe. The Franco-Dutch War would last until 1678, and it would again drag Spain into war. This time, not only England and Sweden, but also the Holy Roman Empire and Prussia would join the alliance against France. The Dutch War could be said to have technically ended with a French victory, as stated in the Peace of Nijmegen, because while Louis was unable to keep all the lands he'd occupied, he did get to keep parts of the Spanish Netherlands and the Franche Comté, essentially establishing France's modern northern and northeastern borders. Despite the fact that France was rapidly running out of money, Louis kept attempting expansion through war. In 1688, the year Louis turned 50, he again went to war against a European Grand Alliance made up of the Holy Roman Empire, the Dutch Republic, England, Spain, Portugal, and Savoy. The Nine Years' War could be considered a global war, as fighting occurred not just in Europe, but also in North America and South Asia. This war also encompassed fighting in Ireland during England's so-called bloodless or glorious revolution, where Louis supported the ousted and Catholic English King James II. As Louis occupied territory, he sometimes ordered his soldiers to kill everyone they saw, and he prohibited rebuilding in those territories so as to curtail continuing rebellion. As might be imagined, this order did not, in fact, curtail rebellion, and so the war dragged on beyond Louis's ability to pay for it. To make matters worse, in the early 1690s, crop failures in France caused widespread starvation in the countryside, and Louis faced domestic turmoil. The Nine Years' War ended with the Treaty of Ryswick in 1697. Louis had to give up most of the territories he'd conquered in the Holy Roman Empire, the Spanish Netherlands, and northern Spain, although he was able to keep Alsace. Territories in North America remained essentially unchanged, and the French suffered defeats, but really no loss of territory, in South Asia. One would think that Louis, now nearly 60, would have reconsidered the utility of war as a means of expansion. The three wars he'd already fought had eroded the national treasury which Colbert's careful mercantilist policy had built up. The constant need for soldiers meant multiple unpopular conscriptions, multiple drafts, and most of the soldiers were drawn from the peasantry and the urban middle class. These were men who did not have military training, nor did they own weapons that could be used for war they had to be trained and supplied. Moreover, those peasants living near battlefields or along the roads to battlefields were expected to house and feed the soldiers to quarter them. This was a truly taxing burden as, by the end of Louis's reign, one in six Frenchmen had served in his army. Alas, Louis was not done. In 1700, Spain's King Charles II died, childless. A Charles had named as his primary heir his grand-nephew, Philip of Anjou. Philip was the grandson of Louis XIV and his first wife, the Spanish princess Maria Teresa. He was the second son of Louis XIV's oldest son and heir. Should Philip refuse the throne, Charles of Spain had named a secondary heir, Charles Habsburg, who was the youngest son of the Holy Roman Emperor, Leopold I. Well, Philip of Anjou accepted the throne and became Philip V of Spain. The Holy Roman Empire, as well as the rest of the Grand Alliance, England, the Dutch Republic, Sweden, etc., protested this move 
as it had the potential to unify Spain and France under one monarch, even though Philip had agreed upon his coronation that Spain and France would remain separate states. And so, France went to war again in support of the Spanish king this time in the War of Spanish Succession, which began in 1701. While Louis XIV did not initiate this war, the Grand Alliance did, he took advantage of the opportunity to potentially expand France's borders yet again and to destabilize the Holy Roman Empire. As with the Nine Years' War, fighting did occur in North America, where it was known as Queen Anne's War, but much of the fighting focused in Spain's extended territories in Italy and the Netherlands. Because of the Anglo-Portuguese alliance, Spain also faced fighting within its borders. Philip was able to keep most of his Spanish lands, although he did lose Gibraltar to the English in 1704. However, Philip did eventually lose his Italian lands to the Holy Roman Empire. Although Louis XIV was ready to arrange for peace by 1708, the Holy Roman Empire and England preferred to keep fighting, hoping to force Philip to give up the Spanish throne. However, they'd underestimated France's ability and willingness to keep fighting and Philip's insistence on keeping the throne. Louis began exploiting the weaknesses he saw in the Grand Alliance, particularly the growing closeness between Britain and the Holy Roman Empire. When the Dutch became aware that Britain and the Holy Roman Empire had begun negotiating trading rights in Spanish America, even though their victory was not assured, the Dutch were more willing to negotiate with France and Spain. And then, in 1711, the Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I died, and his heir was Charles, the same Charles who'd hoped to become the King of Spain. It was now obvious that the members of the Grand Alliance did not favor a reunified Habsburg Empire, Spain plus Austria, that had existed in the 16th century, any more than they'd favored the possibility of a unified Spain and France under Philip the willingness to fight fizzled, and all parties renewed negotiations for peace. Three separate treaties negotiated the end of the War of Spanish Succession, the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 and the Treaties of Rastatt and Baden in 1714. While the war left France largely unchanged, except for severe bankruptcy, other states experienced more severe effects. The Dutch Republic was also essentially bankrupt, and the conscription of its merchant vessels for war had effectively ceded preeminency in global trade to Britain, who was, in the end, the greatest beneficiary of the war. Spain kept its colonial empire, but lost the Spanish Netherlands and parts of Italy to Austria. The Holy Roman Empire, led by the Austrian Habsburgs, would continue to decentralize as individual German states, most notably Prussia, gained power and influence. Louis XIV died in 1715, four days shy of his 77th birthday, and just one year after the conclusion of the War of Spanish Succession. He'd outlived his son and his grandson. His heir was his five-year-old great-grandson, also named Louis. On his deathbed, Louis is alleged to have warned his heir not to emulate him too closely, for he'd loved war too much. The problem, of course, was that Louis had reigned for so long, 72 years or 64 years, if we're just counting the years that he held control of the government, and he had influenced generations of absolutist monarchs. And that influence was evident well into the 18th century. <laughs> 